In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In our first reading, we heard a snippet of the Adam and Eve story in Genesis. It's always an interesting challenge to deal with Genesis in this day and age, because we read it so differently from how it would have been read before, or at least a lot of us do. We have this modern tendency to say, okay, this is history and these are the facts about what happened. And we lose track of the way it was written, which is, this is our story. This is the story that explains why things are the way they are. Now, it actually doesn't explain everything, but if you look at this whole story of and of the beginnings of humanity, you can see the questions that the writers were attempting to get at. Why is it that life is hard? Shouldn't it be easy? Why is it that bad things happen, even when we don't want to? Why is it that sometimes it seems that no matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to do good, or we hurt each other, or things don't go right? Why isn't everything just wonderful like we think it ought to be? So those are all the big questions that everybody has asked at some point in our lives. And so here's a story. And the story talks about a loving God who planted a garden and put two people in it to help to till and to tend the garden But the two people, rather than staying in the relationship that they were put there to do, a relationship of love and trust, broke that trust, broke the relationship, and thus broke the beauty of what happened. It explains a lot about how human beings are. It explains our tendency even when we think we're basically good people, which most of us all think we're good people, we still have this amazing ability to do bad things from time to time. And we also, rather than look to God, rather than hold on to and place our trust in that relationship, we have this tendency to do, <clears throat> to do it ourselves. And when we mess up, rather than to claim the mess up for ourselves, what do we do? Well, if we kept reading, reading in the story, we'd have seen the perfect example of how human beings always are. Perfect example. When God discovers what has happened with Adam and Eve. And uh, he looks to Adam and he said, what have you done? What did Adam do? Did he say, oh, I did what you told me not to do. I was really bad. I'm... Did he do that? No. He said, it's her fault. She made me do it. Right? And God turns to Eve and said, what have you done? And she said, it was the snake. Blame the snake. Now, what's happening there is they were self-justifying themselves. Look, you know, I, it's, not my, it's not my fault. It's, I, there's a reason for this. I can make a good excuse. We all know this. We've all tried it. When I was a kid, I was probably the worst student in terms of ever getting any work done that any teacher has ever seen. Now, some of you I know are teachers, and you've probably experienced students who are just incredibly procrastinating and lazy and don't do their homework. And in in my case, what was even more incredible was rather than put the time and effort into getting the work done, I put my time and effort into coming up with ever more amazing excuses for why I didn't get it done. I think if there was an award to go out for lame excuses, I would have won it. But, in essence, that's what Adam and Eve is doing. It's what we all tend to do. We want to justify ourselves rather than admit 
claim the fact that we have broken something and we have nothing to stand on. Now the gospel story today, we have this story of Jesus, which is also, I want to emphasize, a story that after his baptism, he went out into the wilderness, into the desert, to be tested, fasting. And he there was tested by the devil. We heard the story. The church has always held that in this story, we see the reversal of the Adam and Eve story. We see the human being who did not break, who remained faithful no matter what, who hung on to that relationship with God and never let it be broken, who restored humanity to what it was supposed to be. You can make all th- sorts of things out of, uh, you know, turn the stone into bread, jump off the top of the temple, look at all the mountains of the world, but this is basically Jesus was out to be tested to see if, in fact, he would be faithful. And this was not, of course, his only test. It was only the first, but it wasn't his last. And it's really emblematic, though, of what all of Jesus was about. His entire life in ministry was about being faithful, about maintaining the relationship with God the Father, the Creator, and of being faithful to God's call of love and service all the way to the cross. Now, it's the whole of Jesus, including his life and his death on the cross, that makes him who St. Paul said he was in that epistle reading. Paul claims him as the second Adam, the new Adam, the person who has restored humanity from the brokenness that it's always been in. There's no magic here, though. Jesus restores humanity by remaining faithful, by keeping the relationship with God, by holding that all the way. And it's in that sacrifice, in that life, that we can make now our claim. Paul uses that fancy, tech, fancy theological term that, that while the one man's, i.e. Adam's, trespass led to death and the brokenness of sin, and you know, you don't even have to physically die to be dead in a broken life, alienated from God with all the things that can go wrong in the world. But life, life comes, Paul says, through the new man, Jesus. And he uses that theological term. Through him brings justification. Now, we've often had a little hard hard time, I think, trying to think, well, what does he mean by justification? Let's go back to my earlier example of we all know what it's like to try to self-justify ourselves. Well, you know, it really, it wasn't my fault. It didn't do that, you know, and it never works. But, but Paul says, we don't, now we don't need to do that. We can put our claim in Jesus. By claiming that relationship in Jesus, we can, we have total access to a God who will forgive us our sins and then God will justify us. How much better to be, rather than to be self-justified than to be God-justified? Now, it still seems a little esoteric, probably. So let me kind of give you an example. Every once in a while, we manage to reflect the image of God, even in our brokenness. And I think one of the best examples is maybe you've had this happen sometime, somewhere along the line, you have messed up big time. And you have hurt 
your spouse or your parent or your child. And in the brokenness and the shame of all that, you stand with nothing and you're going, oh. And what you expect is the person you have hurt to rail against you and denounce you and tell you. And instead of doing that, they say, yeah, you messed up big time, but I still love you. And isn't that liberating when it happens? It doesn't make what you did wrong go away, but all of a sudden it doesn't matter. It's, okay, you still love me. And see, God justifies us through Jesus. God justifies us not as perfect, not as sinful, but God justifies us as beloved. That is the grace of God, which Paul says abounds. That is, there's so much of it, it's like, it's like when you're pouring the tea into the teacup and you forget to stop and it just flows over the top and keeps going. That's what the grace of God is like. It just soaks everything. And we can, we can put our lives, the term we always love in the Bible, we can abide in that grace and live into the fullness of God's love where we are forgiven for the sins that even though we may try not to, we still do, but we can be forgiven and live in the grace of a God who forgives and then loves and justifies us in that way. The place we locate that is our baptism. We think of we probably think a lot of things of our baptism, but it is so much more than just one day when we were really young where people said a few words and we got a bit wet. In baptism, we die with Christ. We are baptized into Christ's death and die to sin in our lives and are reborn into the life of Christ where we can abide in the grace of God. And when we mess up, we don't have to justify ourselves. We can point to our baptism and say, we are children of God and we are loved. We know we did wrong, but we're still your children. We still have this. Now, there's so much more to baptism. That's only a first point. But just like the liberating feeling that we get when we know we're forgiven by someone, that same liberating feeling, that same liberation that comes from being loved and accepted by the grace of God through baptism opens the door to a completely different and fulfilling life. Over these next few weeks of Lent, we will be exploring further what baptism means beyond the forgiveness and acceptance and justification for our sins, to the full openness of the ability to live in the grace of God and what that might mean in all its various ways. So I invite you, as we have already started on Ash Wednesday, to enter into this holy period of Lent in which we can ponder the deeper meaning of what it means to be baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to be born again into this new world of grace and how it can transform us and the world around us. Amen.